So uh, he has a very long name of, for his presentation, but uh, with his permission, I'm going to shorten it to interoperability. <laughs> uh, he's Robert Zaremba. He's an ambassador for eternity for Switzerland. And please welcome. A round of applause for Robert. OK, cool. Hello, everyone. So I'm very happy to talk today here about interoperability. The original title was about something related to creating, driving, and ensuring we have enough compliance uh, for what we build and making sure that what we build actually makes sense in the real world. So let's roll the ball. Uh, about me, I'm a computer scientist and entrepreneur. Uh, I was running few startups and uh, I'm a consultant for um, uh, financial technologies. And if you want to contact me, just use this website. Uh, yeah, I'm based in Geneva. So um, we will talk about the standards. Then we will talk about uh, how about com composability, and then we will finish with interoperability. And uh, let's start with the standards. Uh, I guess everyone knows this symbol. It's uh, from International Standard Organization. Some of you may see it as a, like a big unnecessary thing to why we need it. Those guys are spending lots of time in the office and creating a standard for, I don't know, like creating a standard, you know, it may take years, five, six, seven, eight years. Why the hell? And uh, fortunately, this is really required because uh, having a standard is well, well, well needed thing in, in the real world and especially in the business. So uh, first thing, what the standards brings to us is the common understanding of a product. Why this is so important? Because once there is a standard, there is a tons of specifications, tests, which will define uh, what is needed from the product to be compliant with it. On the other hand, for the users or uh, producers of a product, they will have a clear vision how to make sure that if something is compliant, how to build something to, to make it compliant, to make it usable. So to not go into the traps which uh, others already found while creating the standard. Uh, and through safety, which is very related to the first point that a standard brings us the notion, okay, if, if this is compliant with a certain standard, uh, most probably, it is it is secure. We have a standards for for security. We have a standards for you uh, for quality and so on. And uh, here, probably like one uh, one example, like tooling for tests uh, integration. So we have like standards ways how we how we how we define the tests, how we how we do the integration. And a real world example I would like to use is is rope testing. Uh, so if I'm going to a shop and want to buy a, a rope for climbing. I will look for a rope which was attested so to make sure that uh, I will probably not die because the rope will cut. Uh, ensure that products are tailored made for their purpose. Uh, ski boots. So uh, for those who, who are skiing or to, to know how this ski boot works, yes, uh, we have basically two uh, systems for the, for the ski boots. One is for the alpine skiing and one for technical skis. And uh, there, so there, there are two, two slots, two types of slots, and tons of shoes you can use for a variety of purposes. Uh, again, because we have a standard for it, we all the producers can can really reason how how this should be built, and still provide a freedom for them, for the boots producers, to uh, to provide uh, like a, a tailor made for for the usage uh, uh, boots. Uh, cold linters, another thing. Facilitate operations by removing barriers. So chargers, probably everyone knows that like 20 years ago, we had two or three bolts for charging our Nokia phone, old Nokia phone. There was another one for Sony Ericsson, another one for, for, for Samsung. They were changing. Thankfully, five years ago, we had only two for uh, micro USB and, and, and Apple iPhones. Now we have three because uh, the micro USB is getting, getting deprecated. But OK, we are getting there. Uh, same for the credit cards, even our wallet. Our wallets are designed to, to store all the ID cards or the credit cards, and they work because they have the same size. They look the same. Uh, interoperability of products and services, containers. Here I'm not talking about the Linux containers, about uh, containers in the shipment industry. So the all supply chain is designed for containers because it's so usable that we can easily uh, 
create whole the industry around it. How we ship the products, elevators, how we put them on the tracks and so on. Norman Doors. Uh, so Norman Doors is a great, great example of, uh, of usability. Uh, who knows it? Anyone heard about Don Norman and the Norman Doors term? So Don Norman is a very famous uh, UX expert, a researcher and designer. He was working for Apple and for many other companies. And he crafted this term for Norman Doors. So Norman Doors is basically a door which fails to fulfill saying how to use it. Uh, so if, if, if you enter into the building and you need to spend a second how to use the doors, should you push it or pull it, you are facing a Norman Doors. Um, and he, he talks about it uh, in a different concept in his book uh, called uh, the, the Design of, Every of Everyday Things. I really highly recommend it to, to everyone who is doing anything. Really, uh, designers, software engineers, product managers, everyone. Uh, so here you can see, okay, so the door has a handler, so probably maybe I should pull it, but it doesn't work because you, sh you should push the doors to, to, to get into. Uh, there was a GIF, uh, and it, it really uh, provides the right animation about what the Norman doors is. Unfortunately, it doesn't work here. So, um, so now we're going uh, uh, back to the blockchain world, world and probably ever now, everyone knows ERC-20. And this is just a copy paste from the first uh, paragraph. So motivation was the motivation for ERC-20. A standard interface which allows any tokens on Ethereum to be reused by other applications from wallets to decentralized exchanges. And uh, I will already say what's wrong here. Or maybe anyone wants to guess what's wrong here. I mean, wh wh where is the failure? We, in which part the ERC20 already, this, this motivation doesn't work. Anyone? OK, so uh, any. Where is it? Any tokens. And I will explain it uh, in a minute, so stay with me. Uh, but before that, uh, going back to what we've dis been discussing about the standards, why they are useful, I would like to say about the adoption. So. Uh, Adoption is driven by easy way to start using um, our products and a common understanding. The better we understand what we are using, or the easier it is what we do, the, the broader adoption the, the, we have. Uh, composability uh, in, in terms of the blockchain. So tokens are made really to high composability. We should use it in a variety of the applications. So a token can have a multiple forms. So um, from the legal perspective, uh, they can be designed as a payment token, utility token, asset token, and a security token. And it is very important because if any one of you is designing a token and it's, if it's going to be used in the real world, as soon as it will have a value, yes, uh, the, there will be a, a legal, uh, legal regulations which will be touching to that token. And uh, on the other hand, this token uh, will be used in exchanges and financial applications those will need to have some compliance uh, rules and they need to be linked with an identity of, of, of a user. Uh, down there, yes, the token can be, can be, can be created by uh, crowd sale, wallets, games. So we have multiple ways of using it. This creates a composability. We need to define the tokens, so having a standards way, how we can compose these tokens. Token legos, anyone heard about it? So it's a brilliant term, and uh, uh, Ethereum already crafted perfectly. So Ether is a volatile asset. I know, I think everyone knows it. So uh, we can use the volatile asset to create a stable asset using uh, MakerDAO as, uh, as, as, as a contract for creating DAI. Then we can move forward with it. We can use a stable asset to create a volatile interest rate using uh, compound, to, to compound DAI. Then we can uh, use that uh, uh, volatile interest rate and uh, tokenize it to uh, provide or to assign the interest rate to a third party. So I can still have, may have a control to, um, uh, uh, as a lender, yes, to, to, the, to the tokens or to the assets I'm lending, but I can say, okay, I, I want to um, 
I, I want to uh, give the whole the interest rate from, to my grandmother. Uh, but it still is a volatile interest rate. So how about packing it and creating a, a, a swap for interest rate to have a stable interest rate? So my grandmother will know that, okay, every day or every month she will have, I don't know, whatever, $100 based on my, uh, co based on my uh, uh, collateral or loan uh, I'm doing in the, uh, for compound finance. So this is uh, is DAI. Uh, and recently there was created a GDAI. GDAI is basically a gasless DAI. So uh, we can... Uh, we can use, so there is a fulcrum, we can uh, swap the tokens uh, for the fulcrum to, to have a, a GDAI and, and trade and transfer all the, all the, all the stable coins of the DAI, yes, to any other party without paying a gas for it. So we are using the, the interest rate for uh, lending the DAI using this uh, fulcrum bank to uh, basically have a free transfers of the DAI. Awesome, right? So. Uh, so as you see, yes, like we can we can compose the different uh, forms of our token to define different uh, uh, features. Uh, but the but the very important thing is that this works only because this this token, the smart contracts we are creating, can talk to one another. And the very important thing is that the thing at the top, the volatile asset. We want to swap it. We want to change it. It should work with any volatile asset as long as it provides enough liquidity. So a market for it. And this is what we want to have. Unfortunately, if it goes to the real world, uh, it doesn't work that well. Because uh, the ERC-20 token, while being the, one of the major fillers of Ethereum success, it's also a source of the whole evil. Why? because it's very basic, it works, it's super easy to be used, but to adopt it to a real world scenario, it fails. Uh, it fails because uh, we can't link it. So as soon as token has a value, we can't link it easily with a compliance rules. And this is in fact like whenever you are creating a, a value in the real world and you provide users to exchange it, out of your business, outside of your, of your business structure, you are facing it. And uh, then if you, if, you, if, you, if you go back to this image of this Legos, as long as you can't reason in a compliance way how this transfer, how these tokens, where these tokens come from, then you have a whole, whole big mixture of, of the problems to, in fact, uh, uh, inform the, the receiver, the receiver can be a user or, or a smart contract if he should accept the, the tokens or not. And you may ask, why should I not accept the tokens? Well, uh, because uh, of the AML reasons or all the regulatory reasons. So ERC-20 flows, not being able to notify a recipient smart contract. If I'm sending you a, a, a tokens and if you expect some callback, well, I don't need it. This is the way how it's solved now. Yes, we have this um, pair of uh, allowance and a transfer form. I will talk about it a little bit later, but uh, I need to create, in fact, two transactions to allow another contract to make an action for me to spend the tokens if I want to basically pay for something. Uh, and another way is what, what well doesn't work is that if I'm, let's say, Coming to the real world example, in the financial transactions, when I'm sending a money or a token, whatever asset, from one bank to another, from one financial intermediary to another financial intermediary, the second one is responsible for receiving these tokens or the asset, which means that eventually he needs to decide that should I accept it or not. Because if it doesn't have enough information where the asset comes from, it means that it will fail to provide enough um, information for the regulatory perspective. Uh, notably anti-money laundering, a loss of tokens. So again, if I'm sending a, a, a tokens to a smart contract and the smart contract can't use it for any reason because it didn't implement uh, the interface for, um, for using tokens, then they are lost forever. Uh, in 2017, they said that there was around 3 million worth of dollars 
uh, 3 million worth of dollar tokens being locked in Ethereum network. And that was two years ago, so uh, probably it'll grow. Um, and you can't do anything with that. Uh, most of the tokens are meant are a mean of payment, so probably with compliance, this is what I was talking mostly. Lack of clear understanding of the product. So, because if we have a basic thing, uh, we it's so easy to, to, to do something with it, but not necessary to do it in a legal way. So again, think about it in the ski boot example and, and uh, uh, ski bindings. If we design um, a binding which are super simple, let's say uh, like mounting like uh, snowshoes, okay? There are just few straps. And if, if you would do it like in this way, it will fail to, to deliver or for the producers to, to construct this, this ski boots in a way that will be secure and safe. Uh, so there has to be a work done to make sure that whenever we define a standard, uh, it will be really compliant, complied with, with the usage and in, with the market we are driving to. Okay, so let's look now at this legal part of it. Um, let me start with uh, who heard about Corda, Arfi Corda? Okay, there are a few people. So Corda is a permission blockchain uh, from New York City uh, company, and they are targeting financial institutions. And what they really, what the message they are trying to send to the community is following. Yes, Corda from the very beginning claims that it's creating an architecture that will model and automate real world, world transactions in a legally enforceable manner. This is a common pitfall for many blockchains that the transactions they store do not have a legal value. Instead, smart contracts in Corda have not only transaction, uh, transaction information, but also a legal pros. And why, one may think about it a little bit. So the first question I had in my mind when I, um, when I uh, re read that, um, that paragraph was, hmm, whenever I need to create a transaction and send it to the blockchain, I need to sign it. I need to sign it with my private key, private, like this is my identity, it's linked to my identity. So why, how, how, how possible it doesn't have a, a legal pros, a, a legal form? And the uh, Swiss uh, Federal Council, in fact, uh, have an answer for that. So they created a report in the end of 2018, so last year. And it says, a token so smart contract is merely an entry in a decentralized register and has no legal effect on its own. However, such an entry can be based on a right that was established through a legal transaction and also exists independently on the link with a token, smart contract. In other words, we need to be able to make that link. So whenever there is a, a phrase, terms and condition, whatever, uh, reference needed for two people to transact, transact two organizations to transact, or business and a customer, the token, the, 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 the transfer function, has to be able to provide that link. So therefore, uh, Assuming that, okay, we just make a transaction and only sign it by a private key, it fails to, to provide that requirement. Uh, Switzerland is uh, well known for its, let's say, a very uh, well-defined uh, regulatory market and a strict one. And there, it, okay, I don't know if it's a, like an advantage or not a disadvantage, but they have the most lawyers per capita <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> probably financial reasons. Uh, so we need to have a standard to provide a, a, a way where we will understand what we are building and to make sure that the tooling, that the whole thing on the different levels we build will be usable with, uh, um, with tokens, for example, here. But we don't need to do it from the scratch. Uh, fortunately, yes, there, there are other blockchains, there, there, they were looking at it, and instead of recreating the wheel, we can just go and, and, and see what the others do. Uh, so I will go back a little bit again to Ethereum, and uh, they created many proposals, many standards, to uh, fix the issues of ERC-20. 
Uh, Stellar is widely used, in fact, in uh, financial institutions. Okay, not very widely, but it is used. It's based on the Ripple, by the way, created by banks. And they already from the beginning have the, the transactions which are meant to be used by banks. So uh, I will not talk much about it, but want to say that there are a bunch of standards to, uh, to, to solve it. The big problem of them is that they are either ERC-20 compatible or ERC-20 not compatible. Uh, and the problem is that for those, which are, oh, for those which are not ERC-20 compatible, they are facing the adoption um, issue because there is the, all the market assumes that all the tokens in Ethereum are ERC-20. Well, so we, we are in the, in the rabbit hole. We, we can't do much. Uh, so the motivation, when so let's create a standard to make sure that it will be compliant. Of course, if you don't want to use it, if you don't want to use the compliance portion, you don't need to. But then at least the tools we will build on top of that will be able to reason about our token and, 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 we, can, uh, and we can provide that composability. Be responsive, I will talk about it in a second. Uh, and having uh, registered interfaces. So to know a little bit more about the tokens or the contracts we are dealing with. So again, let's look at the ERC-20 token transfer. So I want to talk here about the communication. So if you have a two smart contracts and we want to communicate between them with a token, uh, the most easy way, for example, is to think about in the terms of an exchange. I want to place an order for an exchange and then exchange uh, will route my, my order with, uh, within the market, so put it in a, in a book, and then someone can take that order and fulfill it. So how it's done? I mean, for the decentralized exchange, I always want to have a control for that token. So I don't want to relay that if the exchange will be hacked, something bad will happen. Uh, usually it works that uh, we have this allowance mechanism. So what do we do? So I, I'm an owner. I'm, um, I'm approving the uh, using the, my token. So, so the token information is in ERC-20 compatible token. And that uh, a contract, so let's say exchange, uh, can spend, can transfer my tokens. Yeah? So let's say that I'm willing to, uh, uh, to trade uh, 20 ABC tokens. So, so I'm, I'm proving uh, a, my ABC tokens here for, um, to be spent by, by, by an exchange. So then when, uh, when the order is taken, um, the, the exchange will call transfer form that contract and move it to, uh, uh, to the recipient of it. So the problem here is that I have no guarantee except the amount how this um, token will be used. So first of all, uh, I'm not sure, for example, if, well, how, let's put it this way. The only thing I'm, I'm putting here is that who and how much can spend the tokens, but anything about uh, how it will be used. So if, for example, I want that okay, there's the casino, and I want that casino will charge my account, but only for its internal purpose, I have no control for it. If, uh, if the casino will be charging like too frequently for, uh, these tokens, I, I, I can't design it. Yes, the, the, there is a limitation, a huge limitations about what I can do it. The only thing I'm, I'm, I'm controlling here is that who and how much. If I want to, let's say, add some um, uh, time boundary, no way. I need to make another transaction and, and really like control it or hire some automated uh, mechanism which will do a transaction for me. So there was a two to three uh, standard which tried to fix it. So they introduced the token fallback mechanism. Uh, it is meant that, okay, so when I'm spending, when the token is spending, um, uh, sorry, when smart contract is spending a transaction, the recipient can be notified and can control, for example, okay, can I accept it? For example, for the AML reasons, um, these tokens. Or, uh, yeah, that's the main case. But uh, also, let's say, if it's compatible for it or not. However, I still don't have a control uh, me myself as a, as, uh, as an owner holder of the tokens, 
to make sure that the spender will use the tokens in the right way, because he can do it in any way. He just call, uh, he has just an ability to call back the, the recipient. Another failure here is that it's uh, related to the contract. So if the contract doesn't implement that token fallback mechanism, then we can't do anything. If the contract is old, or if the contract wants to change the fallback mechanism for many, any reason, yes, there are some hacks being made like with a proxy contract, but it's complex. If the contract is already there and wants to change some mechanism, then sorry. Uh, again, we are in a rabbit hole. So uh, there is this proposal I made, I just call it EX11, but I'm not sure if it's the right, right name or whatever. <laughs> I was working for it a little bit, like whenever I had, had the time and push it on me today. <laughs> so um, it's based on um, ERC-77 uh, made by uh, Jordi Bellina and Jacques. Uh, they were from Switzerland. And uh, also, and uh, so, so, so the concept is how we, how we solve this issue where we want to put a control between the token holder and the, uh, and the spender of it, so who will who will use my tokens and the recipient to to make this compliant mechanism. So the idea is the following: so we introduce the operators, so the spender, so the one who will be using my tokens is an operator, and we introduce um, a callback mechanism as a separate contract. So in ha in, instead of directly trying to call a callback from a either um, sender side or a recipient side, uh, we generalize that thing and uh, we can register any callback on any contract. So this is how it works. So again, holder, let's say it's Alice or me, token ABC token, I, I'm authorizing an operator. So operator is, where is the operator? Okay, uh, DAP here, yeah, a DAP to, to use my tokens. And I say, okay, hey DAP, hey exchange, use 20 of my maximum, 20 of my tokens, whatever. Whenever you are, but whenever you want to use my tokens, call this function. Uh, so now the DAP is, uh, is using my token, is, is, is using the operator transfer. He needs to, okay, call the function, which is okay here, like part of the interface, token to transfer for the uh, holder approver, so the one I nominated, the contract I nominated to control my uh, token spending. Then the token spending can fail, uh, abort the whole process. If it say, hey, sorry, uh, you already spent too much or you, you used too many tokens today, uh, you can't do anything. But also what's very interesting, uh, that the holder approver, he knows where the DAP want to spend the tokens. So. In the previous examples, yes, there, is, there was no way to see and control how the spender will use the tokens. If like where that where that where where he will spend these tokens. Here I can uh, uh, I can control it. And then also for the other side, the receiver, uh, the receiver gets the same information and can also either approve or uh, accept that that transfer or reject it. Yes, again for a compliance reason. If 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 he doesn't have enough information or there is not enough clarity on this token Legos, uh, where and how this final asset which we are transferring uh, came from, then this is what the banks do. Yeah, They just not approve or will ask for more information. In ERC-20 tokens, if the token if the transfer failed, the standard itself doesn't provide any clue why it failed. When I'm sending the tokens, to, uh, sorry, as a bank transfer, I can always call a bank and say, hey, why it failed? And they will answer me, yes, uh, what should I do to, to, uh, to make the transfer happening? Uh, okay, and so, so, so uh, with, with, when everything uh, works, we just uh, fire an event that to, to notify uh, anyone who is listening on that token transfers that it, um, it was submitted and executed, and then we do an uh, situation that DAPS wants to do. So let's say if the DAP is a relayer, a connector to another blockchain, casino, and executed the, the function, yes, then it can move forward, let's say, and run the game. So it's here. Uh, so pull request 95. Uh, the specification is here. I would be very, very happy if you or anyone can comment on it. 
okay, another thing I was discussing here was uh, gas payments. Uh, that was in the forum, and uh, <laughs> we had a few discussions with people around here about uh, how or what we can do with a gas payment. So this is very also important for um, uh, interoperability between the user or the tools and 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 the smart contract. So to provide a way in a very friendly manner that I want to have a service and want to deliver the service to any user without really like asking him. Uh, to or adding a complexity for having a gas. So let's say if I have my utility token, then if I if a user wants to do any um, action or a transaction with with my decentralized application, he has to have both the utility token and the AE token. And uh, yeah, and it has a problem. He has to go to the exchange or buy it in a way. But maybe I just want him. Hey, just you know, provide me your uh, uh, credit card. I will charge you automatically no this is what is happening in the real world yes like if i'm paying for a service on the internet i just you know registering my card and i'm very happy for it <laughs> yeah that i don't need to do anything it's automated i would like to have the same thing in a on a, a dub site and the last part is of this interoperability is about the blockchain itself uh, so we shouldn't try to make a single tool or a single solution for solving everything. Yeah, there is no tool for every job. Uh, there is a concept of a Hosmos Hub. So uh, to anyone here who is not familiar with, with, with this concept, it's a basically uh, inter-blockchain communication protocol, which allows to uh, transact with other blockchains. So uh, we shouldn't underestimate the value within uh, another systems. Yeah, that uh, if there is a lot of, let's say, assets tokenized on, on Ethereum, okay, let's be happy because they are in the blockchain. We, we let's find a way how we can inter uh, interoperate with it. Yes, rather than trying to force everyone, like you either try to swim against the, the wave or, or with a wave. Uh, I prefer to <laughs> swim with a wave. <laughs> um, so there are many ways how we can solve this interoperability. More notably, they are like based on the notary services. It's a kind of a third party, probably like not very welcome in the blockchain world because it provides some centralization. Sidechains relayers and a hash locking. Hash locking usually relays. Uh, um, it's a pretty advanced mechanism on the cryptography in a way how we can. Um, deconstruct or construct a key in a fully decentralized manner without any single party knowing the key based on the multi-party computation. Uh, the current solutions, as far as I know, are um, patented for it. Uh, like an um, example is, uh, what's the name of it? Fusion blockchain from, um, uh, Chinese they did it, I forgot the name. Okay, I think that's the last one. Hope it was useful. Thank you. Right. Do we have, I think, one question, guys? Yeah, we'll take one and we'll... I mean, thanks for being so active, like, in our like, internet universe. But one thing I want to tell you, we were actually talking about delegated fees transfers on our workshop before the... It... Oh, okay, so, yeah, it's actually on our agenda. Yeah, but the way you, you wanted it, it created... I mean, the, the way I was reading... Yes, we were talking with Hans about it, the way it was designed, I mean, um, discussed in the forum, I was reading it, I think, yesterday or two days ago, required interaction between parties. And maybe there is a way how to do it without the interaction, interactivity. And we were just proposing one way of doing it without the interaction. So, like, again, uh, trying to do it as lean as possible as like, avoiding any additional steps or hurdles uh, on the user side. I think another round of applause to Robert, guys. Thank you for being the last. Robert? Robert? <laughs> <laughs> right, guys, this is uh, the end. It's it's done, it's finished. Um, thank you, everybody. Thanks to the organizers, to the team, to the helpers, to everyone, everyone, everyone. Most of all, thank you to everybody who has been watching us and who's going to be watching the videos. And now and go and enjoy the after party. I think they've been partying for two hours, so...
Woo! See you next time.